Pandey to present her presentation. Dr. Vidushi Pandey. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Minakshi Sharda, Dr. Pankaj Jain, Dr. S.K. Goen for having uh, this uh, wonderful conference, a uh, national level conference in Kota. It is a matter of pride for all of us and giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, so, prevention of blindness uh, in context of the geriatric population, I have no financial disclosures. Uh, since uh, it's a mixed audience, uh, a bit of a revision, this is the anatomy of the eye and essentially uh, we deal with diseases of the lens, the cornea and the retina. Uh, generally we have had a thinking till now that anything that is anterior is generally diseases of the developing world. They, are, they have better treatments, they have cheaper treatments but anything that is posterior is more costly and has slightly poorer prognosis. So before we talk about blindness, what is blindness, what is the magnitude and why is it important for the geriatric population? This is the latest WHO October 2018 data. 1.3 billion people out of a population of a total of 7.7 .7 billion have some sort of visual impairment in the world and 36 million people are actually blind and most of them are people who are above the age of 50 years. So this is very important for the elderly population. But we also need to know the definition. What do we mean when we talk about somebody being blind? This is, the WHO has adopted the ICD uh, classifications for a long time. So currently it is the ICD-11 of 2018. These are the definitions of mild, moderate and severe visual impairment. And blindness as per WHO is any visual activity of less than 3 by 60 in the better eye. Now India has done a lot of work in the field of blindness. India was the first country to launch the national program for control of blindness in 1976. And uh, blindness in India was defined as a visual acuity of less than 6 by 60. So this was a definition that was more stringent than the WHO definition. But this has now been changed in 2017. So our number of blindness come down from 12 million to 8 million by bringing it in uh, uh, line with the WHO definition. And so currently we have 8.8 .8 million people who are blind and this many people who are moderate to severe visual impairment. This was according to data published in Lancet in 2017. India has done had a lot of progress, so it's not all grim uh, here. The number of cataract surgeries has risen dramatically, 1.2 million in 1992, 3.86 million and currently uh, the data is yet to be published but we do over 6.5 million cataract surgeries per year which is more than what is done in many of the bigger countries. The prevalence of blindness has also come down in the age group above 50 years and this survey results are still awaited officially. So this is a graphics from the uh, IAPB, the International Agency of Prevention of Blindness and uh, 36 million people blind, this many people having visual impairment. Most of these visually impaired people live in middle and low income countries and now even though the prevalence of uh, percentage wise is decreasing, the increase in the number of people, increase in population means that the number of blind is increasing. And now there is also an emphasis on the near vision impairment because in our lifestyle most of the things that we do are have to deal with near vision and this is another big problem with a huge number of population affected simply because they do not have a pair of respiratory glasses to aid in their near vision. So what are the consequences of vision problems in the elderly? This has been proven in multiple studies that if you have vision loss in an elderly, you have many more physical and mental comorbidities. It is associated with depressive symptoms and lower life satisfaction and there is obviously a higher risk of fall in these elderly patients if they have vision problems. Blindness is the third biggest fear among the population, number one being cancer, number two being heart disease and after that people are very afraid of going blind in this age group. And unlike infection and malnutrition causes which are seen in children which are preventable, prevention of blindness in the elderly means basically timely management of diseases. So we may actually want to prevent the diseases like somebody asked how to prevent heart disease but all we can do is manage them timely. So it is like elections, you may want the best of candidates but you have to choose from what you have. So here also we have only timely management, not that we can prevent the diseases altogether. So uh, it may not be preventable but it is avoidable and it is curable. So what are the common eye diseases that are seen in elderly? Cataract, refractive errors, glaucoma, dietetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration and these problems which are not blinding but they are problems nonetheless for the elderly. And this is why blindness is a bigger problem in the geriatric age group because most of these uh, problem causes of blindness like cataract, glaucoma uh, and AMD etc. they occur in age group uh, above 40 or 45 years. 
So rest biopsy is a universal problem. I will not go into it because this does not cause blindness but the number of people affected is very large. This is 2018 data. So many people have a near vision impairment which affects with their lifestyle. Cataract is by far the leading cause of blindness all over the world especially in the developing country. We all know it is a clouding of the crystalline lens. It is called cataract which basically means waterfall in uh, Latin. The symptoms are there is a painless gradual decrease in vision, there is blurring of vision, a glare during night driving, altered color perception and sometimes uniocular diplopia. And all this happens because as the lens gets cloudy, there is scattering of light and that causes blurring of vision. The risk factors are it is basically an age-related process, exacerbated by smoking, poor nutrition and there is higher incidence and it occurs earlier in diabetic people. If your patients uh, had cataract at a certain age, the children are likely to have it at an earlier age. If you had steroid therapy or other eye diseases like uveitis which cause inflammation, then you are likely to develop cataract. This is a slit lamp picture. There are different kinds of cataract depending on where the cataract occurs in the lens. Uh, this, this is an immature cataract. This is a mature cataract, totally white. This is hypermature with wrinkling calcification. This is a mocagnin cataract. These are not details that the general uh, physicians need to know, but it is good to have an idea of the spectrum of cataract. Now, cataract surgery has evolved rapidly over the last few decades in terms of surgical techniques as well as eye designs. Uh, these were the earlier techniques like couching, which were there uh, since 600 BC in the times of Sushru. Then came extra capsular cataract surgery, uh, and then the intraocular lenses. ECC with IOL is still one of the widest performed surgeries because it is less expensive, less machine dependent, lesser learning curve, therefore has lesser complications. It is still suitable for many heart cataracts and small incision cataracts surgery had made ECC also sutureless. So even though in the cities and the developed world we all talk about phacoa massification being the standard of care, but when it comes to eliminating blindness from our country, this is still the go-to surgery for all of us. So, and now phacoa massification, this is the modern surgery. Now this is a short video. It is about the uh, journey of cataract surgery and this just shows how technology in the medical line has evolved. This is one of the earliest surgeries where couching was done. Essentially when the lens was all matured, the zonules were weak, you could use some instrument to push the uh, opaque lens out of the visual cavity. It would fall back into the vitreous and the patient would have a clear visual access. Then uh, Sir Harold Ritty, he invented the first intraocular lens. This is the first intraocular lens being implanted by Harold Ritty. Look at the surgery. I mean if we see surgery like this, probably the residents would fail. So this was done not very long time ago, 1950. This is the cataract that is being removed. Such a large incision. And this was one of the best things that came out of the World War II. That the intraocular lens was implanted because it was found that acrylic is an alert material. Then Charles Kelman, he devised phaco emulsification, which is what we do today. This is the earliest video of phaco emulsification. You remove the lens capsule and then you use uh, ultrasonic probe to go inside and emulsify this uh, cataract into small, small pieces and suck it out of the uh, uh, eyeball. And after that, uh, once the cataract is removed, you implant the intraocular lens. So as you can see from the surgery that was done by Harry Pretty, this is of course an improvement and now it is a highly precise surgery. You not only remove the cataract but you also remove the refractive error. Even if it is a wide cataract you get wonderful results. Uh, we make very small incisions. There are so many tools for achieving different steps of cataract surgery. And after you remove the uh, lens capsule, you then uh, do uh, the phaco emulsification surgery and even in the difficult cases which are mature, which are hyper mature, you can give very good results and not only remove the cataract and place an eyeball but also take care of the rest biopia, the astigmatism, the other refractive errors and so the patients uh, uh, get vision and also become spectacle independent. The lens designs have improved tremendously. Uh, you have foldable lenses which go in through these small incisions you just implant the intraocular lens and that is the end of the surgery. So there is, uh, this is a uh, uh, evolution of surgery that has taken place in the last 50 years. The eyeballs are also, uh, uh, there is a lot of improvement in the designs. You have foldable, non-foldable eyeballs, different materials, monofocal, multifocal, trifocal, accommodating eyeballs to deal with all the kind of refractive errors that you have. This is a multifocal eyeball with near and distant focus. This is the simulated vision. If you have a monofocal angle, you won't be able to see from here. If you have a multifocal angle, so you see for distance as well as for near, and you become class independent. Then we have uh, 
secondary capsule or posterior capsule of opacification, which is essentially that the posterior capsule over which the eye is placed, it becomes uh, uh, thickened with time, and so it needs to be uh, cleared with uh, the eye capsule. You know, this is important because most of the camp surgeries that are done in India today are ECC IUL and many of these patients develop posterior capsular opacification within a short span of time and then they, uh, because laser services are not provided, so we have to evolve methods by which uh, these uh, problems can be handled and patients continue to have good vision. So now coming to the main topic, is it possible to prevent cataract? Now cataract cannot be prevented because it is an age-related process but the progression can be somewhat delayed by using ultraviolet light protection, by having a balanced diet which includes plenty of fruits and vegetables, avoid smoking, control diabetes and control your sunlight exposure. So uh, there is a lot of interest in the public about prevention of cataract and this is the latest, this was an article in Nature where nanosterol uh, eye drops were used to prevent uh, reverse protein aggregation in cataract. So it was used in rapid eyes, human trials are still undergoing uh, the research has been continuing for many many years but nothing complete has come out so far maybe in the next decade or two there will be eye drops that can not only prevent cataract but actually reverse cataract by reversing the protein aggregation in the lenses. The second big problem in this population is, is the glaucoma which essentially means that there is uh, because of intraocular pressure and other reasons there is damage to the optic nerve. Glaucoma is important because it is the second largest cause of blindness after cataract. It is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss. While cataract can be tackled care, uh, taken care of by surgery, this is irreversible vision loss and it is responsible for more than 10% of blindness uh, by natural blindness. And the other important uh, problem is that 93 to 94% of uh, people with open adult glaucoma have not been diagnosed till the survey was done. So most of the people are not aware, even in developed nations, approximately half of the people with glaucoma are unaware of their disease because it is asymptomatic till a very large, late stage. So unless it becomes advanced, this disease is asymptomatic, vision loss is permanent, and because the vision, uh, there is no apparent improvement, there is poor adherence to treatment. So what essentially is the problem with glaucoma is that the aqueous outflow is disturbed and it is of two types, open angle which is asymptomatic, closed angle where the patients have pain, a sudden pain, headache, decrease in vision and is often confused with migraine. There are patients who continue to get treatment for migraine and then when they refer to ophthalmologists it is found that their headache is because of glaucoma. So who is at risk of glaucoma? Again, the elderly people above 40 years, if you have a family history, Earlier glaucoma was synonymous with increased intraocular pressure but now it is one of the factors of glaucoma, one of the most important factors. If you have myopia or hypermetropia, again you are more likely to have glaucoma if you are a diabetic, you have a previous eye injury or if you have a low central cornea thickness, you are likely to uh, be at risk for glaucoma. As I said, open angle glaucoma is largely asymptomatic till it becomes very advanced. Closed angle glaucoma presents with severe symptoms. But many Indian patients have what is called creeping angle closure glaucoma, which presents like open angle only. So again, this is also asymptomatic until a very late stage. For the diagnosis, we do intraocular pressure, optic disc examination, visual fields, take the pressure like this. This is the uh, optic disc cupping. In some cases, you do gonioscopy. This is the restriction of visual field. This is what we see on gonioscopy when you put a contact lens on the eye and you actually see the angle structures to differentiate between an open angle and a closed angle glaucoma. So in glaucoma, the treatment goal is not only to reduce the IOP but also other factors now like neuroprotection, laser protection and to establish a target IOP according to the severity of the disease. And the most important thing is to ensure compliance. So there are different ma ma uh, management modalities. You have lots of eye drops now which are very effective in controlling the glaucoma and intraocular pressure. This is done only for angle closure. Surgery can be done in uh, cases which are not responsive to eye drops. Uh, this is very important. All of us, I think, should emphasize if we see patients of black vision and glaucoma, we should emphasize that it needs to be regularly monitored. And similarly, physicians who see and know that the patient has glaucoma, they should emphasize that this needs to be regularly followed up because this is the most important challenge. This is the surgery that can be done. This is the laser that is done in some cases. So patient compliance is a particularly important issue in glaucoma because glaucoma is asymptomatic and the treatment is preventive. So the patients don't feel that there is any benefit of whatever treatment they are taking. And the, it is a chronic disease. 
There are several medications often, so it is difficult for the elderly patients to put the eye drops themselves, two, three eye drops, two to three times a day. The treatment can be expensive, some of these drops can be very expensive, so we must uh, look for alternatives which are cheaper priced. The uh, local and systemic side effects also contribute and like Dr. Purushottam uh, said, we should always proactively inquire for side effects so that the compliance is improved. Next we come to retinal diseases in the elderly people. The common problems are fluctuations, diabetic retinopathy and age related macular degeneration. Now, this, is, this has got nothing to do with blindness but because it is so common, it is good to know that many patients can experience uh, floaters which appear something like this, things that are floating in your visual vision. They are very disturbing and annoying but they are, in majority of patients they are harmless. All you need is a good retinal examination dilated to ensure that there is no other problem in the retina. Now this is the normal retina uh, which has uh, photoreceptors and RV layer etc. And what happens in ARMD that is age related macular degeneration is that there are depositions of certain materials in the RV layer these are called juicins or they can be neovascular membranes which leak fluid. So the symptoms of ARMD are that there is blurry vision, distorted vision, straight lines can appear wavy and uh, there can be natural loss of central vision, problems in breathing and often ARMD is so subtle uh, to see on the fundus that it is detected after you've done a very successful cataract surgery but the patient does not have a good visual recovery. So you can see all these things, things are distorted, straight lines are wavy, uh, reading is a problem, sometimes you can have a central dark area. This is a picture which shows juicins, this is uh, ARMD, uh, not much of a role of treatment except for antioxidants, this is wet ARMD where you have hemorrhage, you have leakage, in the late stages there is carrying, these are juicins again. This is a neovascular membrane which is leaking on fluorescein angiography. This is carrying. This is uh, carries a very extremely poor prognosis, not much of a treatment available. These are the investigations that you do. Uh, angiography. OCT is a very uh, a good tool that has come in the last 10 years where you can actually see the layers of the retina. And you can see things like macular retina. This is a normal retina. This is retinal pigment epithelium. You can see things like subretinal fluid, pigment epithelial detachment, macular edema, and it is all very clear in the different layers. So prevention, good diet and supplements may have a role, avoid smoking, but unfortunately it is not as responsive to lifestyle modifications as other diseasing, aging diseases like the ischemic heart disease. Uh, good lighting, so we can uh, have some treatment, good lighting, correct glasses, magnification devices to ensure that they continue to lead productive lives. Earlier it was said about therapy that the treatment basically gives patients poor vision to give, keep them from getting terrible vision. So treatment by this device, there is not a uh, very effective treatment as of now but there are these different injections that are available and the cost is also coming down which ensure that the vision that the patients have is maintained. This is how the intravitreal injections are given and they act on the, uh, uh, these are anti-VEGF uh, uh, injections so they prevent the neovascularization and leakage. Diabetic is the next big problem and uh, diabetics are 25 times more likely to go blind. Uh, these are the risk factors, long duration, poor metabolic control, coexistent problems like hypertension, kidney disease, etc. And uh, it's also if you have diabetic retinopathy, the risk of cardiovascular death also increases. These are the things that you see in diabetic retinopathy, uh, in uh, exudates, in microaneurysms, hemorrhages. And these are the kinds of diabetic retinopathy, non-proliferative and proliferative. These are some of the terms that we often use. This is a non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you see hard exudates. And you can have macular edema. This is all leakage that is seen on uh, my uh, angiography. These are hard exudates because of the leakage. This is proliferative diabetic retinopathy, neovascularization leakage from the disc. These are again some pictures. These are laser marks. Treatment is control of all these factors, treating the coexistent problems and regular dilated screening fundus examination in diabetics is a must. This is, cannot be overemphasized, this is still neglected in our country that all diabetics must have a dilated fundus examination at diagnosis and at regular intervals, good control of diabetes, uh, then uh, injections. The aim of all treatment is to maintain their vision, however if there is no treatment then the vision is sure to go down and the patients will end up with very poor vision. In very, um, uh, these are very severe cases which require surgery like vitreous hemorrhage etc. The surgery is very sophisticated and we all want to prevent uh, the patient from going there. So what is the ray of hope in all these geriatric cases? Regular eye examination, regular dilated fundus examination. Cataract has a very cost effective and high quality surgery. 
glaucoma is controllable, ARMP, good nutrition and supplements and at least smoking is something that has a lot of role in many of these eye diseases so we must control it in diabetics, rising obesity, poor diet, all these things should be controlled. Overall 75% of blindness is either preventable, treatable or curable. So it is not a very grim situation. So to conclude, timely diagnosis, adequate management and follow up to ensure good vision for the elderly patients so that they are able to remain independent, mobile, engaged, economically active and have a better quality of life in their daily lives. Thank you.